So, this is a different kind of a uh, ring gyroscope here <coughs> we have the same central post as it is shown here it is fixed only there and the rest of the structure is free to move. Here we see that uh, uh, to the ring there are lot of these combs attached to it and there are two degenerate mode shapes for it. One shape is uh, such that this one, this one, this one and this one that is these four sets of combs oscillate okay? that is as shown over here. They oscillate about this point, this point, this point and this point that is one mode shape. And the other mode shape is as shown here where these two things that I am checking with two arrows these four this about that point about this point about this point and about this point it will go like this as it is shown. So, when we set let us say this one into oscillation that is that is our drive mode the sense mode the other set will start oscillating by measuring the capacitance of these comb fingers that is that one that one that one and that one we can sense if there is any angular rate again it happens because of Coriolis acceleration transferring energy from one mode to another mode. So, this is the principle of micro machine gyroscopes this is also the principle for macro machine ones, but in micro machine gyroscopes we have four different ways of measuring which we discussed in this lecture and all of these have been made into micro machine devices some of them are also commercially available especially the dual mass one is commercially available ring gyroscopes are not yet commercially available, but they also have shown a lot of promise in terms of research. Thank you. Hello, as part of the micro and smart systems course today we are going to begin another topic which is very important in uh, micro systems which is modeling of electrostatic elastic coupled problems. Electrostatic actuation is quite popular in micro systems because it scales very well with miniaturization that is the force here at the micro scale electrostatic force is quite large. We do not do that we do that means that we do not use electrostatic force at macro scale to make our actuators we use their electromagnetic force quite a lot. But electrostatics has this uh, very nice favorable scaling that the force is enormous at that micro scale. And it has an interesting uh, issue with regard to modeling and that is because it couples with the elastic deformation of the structure. We, we will discuss that in uh, today's lecture. Let us consider a very simple uh, problem of two plates that are parallel to each other which we call parallel plate capacitor. Let us go back. Let me parallel plate capacitor that means there are two plates that are parallel to each other this is plate 1 and this is plate 2. Based on what we have seen in uh, micro systems until now you can relate to this type of parallel plate capacitor arrangement in many devices. One is the electrostatic comb drive where we have these uh, fingers uh, which are interdigitated the other ones come in between like this. So, here between this and this I have a parallel plate capacitor and if you imagine a pressure sensor diaphragm I have electrode underneath again I have parallel plate capacitors. And uh, in the case of uh, a, an accelerometer we have something that moves back and forth this way there is a proof mass that moves there is electrode underneath if I measuring capacitance there again I have parallel plate. So, we have many examples where such parallel plate models exist. If I want to know what is the force between these two parallel plates whenever we apply a voltage potential between these two plates. Let us say we have connected 
a battery between these two plates ok. Let us say that potential is V for this battery then what will be the force and the force can be obtained like we had done in the case of mechanical modeling. If you recall we had a theorem called Castigliano's theorem where if you take the partial of strain energy partial derivative of strain energy with respect to the uh, displacement you will get the force in that direction. Similarly, here if you want to get the force we have to take an energy, but that energy is called electrostatic co energy or co here stands for complementary energy complementary energy co energy and that is given by half C B square. Normally you all know that energy stored in a capacitor is half C V square where C is capacitance and V is the potential between the two plates of the capacitor. So, that is called the electrostatic co energy. Now, if you take partial of that with respect to the displacement ok, here we have three variables shown one is the length that is the overlapping area between the plates there is a length and there is a width w there is a length l there is a width w and uh, there is also a gap. So, gap is g length is l and uh, w is the width. Now, if I take derivative of this co energy if I take partial of the co energy with respect to uh, l here as it is shown and take a negative sign that gives me the force in the length direction. So, if I have two plates like this and apply a potential between them they try to align with each other. Let us say I fix the bottom plate and let the top plate move top plate will move so that the overlapping length will increase and that force is given by negative dou E E E sub E is the electrostatic co energy by dou L which is equal to what is given here which is minus half epsilon naught w by g p square. Epsilon naught here is the permittivity of the free space that is there between the two plates like air for example, because capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor is given by epsilon naught a by uh, gap g ok. So, epsilon naught a here is w times l width times length by g ok that is what we have put here. So, that is the force in the length dimension. Similarly, if I want to know the force in the width dimension that is negative of dou E E by dou w as it is shown here that is equal to minus half epsilon naught l by g v square and there is also a force in the gap direction which tries to bring the plates together and that is minus half dou E E by dou G which turns out to be this value. <coughs> Again if we recognize that W L is simply A we can write it as half epsilon naught A by G square times V square that is the force. How do we get this formula? What is the basis for it? For that we need to review the basics of electrostatics itself a very quick review. First whenever we have conductors as it is shown generally in this. So, here we have conductor 1 and there is conductor 2 here both of them are a different potential. The first one is at potential V 1 and second one is at potential V 2 and as you know if let us say V 1 is greater than V 2 there will be field lines going from here to there and if we have uh, the field lines or field curves uh, shown we can see that there is a force that acts between these two bodies which is electrostatic force. First of all the field has a potential which we call the phi we are denoted by phi. Phi is potential electric potential or simply what we call the voltage and E the electric field is negative of the gradient of this phi that means that this is a vector phi is a scalar 
okay, E is a vector. The gradient symbol here stands for if I take this phi, that phi is going to be different because the potential here is V1, this is V2, in between it is going to vary. So, that variation dou phi by dou x. So, if I take uh, a coordinate system in this, this is x axis, this is y axis, out of plane is uh, let us say z axis, dou f by dou x in the ith direction, that is there is unit vector in the x direction, okay, plus dou phi by dou y j dou phi by dou z k all with the negative sign. So, that is i that is j unit vector the j and this unit vector k that is a gradient. So, once you know potential which is a function of x, y and z. If you take a gradient and put the negative sign you get the electric field those are the lines that are schematically shown here these are not the exact lines for these this problem they are schematically shown how the electric field is going to uh, be for this problem. Now, what we want to know is electrostatic force. That electrostatic force is given by this formula. This is also a vector and uh, here what we see is half psi square surface normal. This is a unit normal that is everywhere if I take the surface here there will be a normal to the surface and hat is what how we denoted divided by epsilon with a permitted intervening medium that is permittivity of this medium. Permittivity is a property of the material and that permittivity is given by epsilon and uh, sometimes we write it as epsilon r times epsilon naught. Epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space and epsilon r is called the dielectric constant dielectric constant r we also call it relative permittivity, relative permittivity. It is a busy slide, but note that whenever we have two conductors, they can be more than two also. We need to first determine the electric potential which will vary from point to point. Inside the conductor potential will be the same, the entire conductor will be at the same potential like we have shown V1 and V2 here and in between it is going to vary and if you take the gradient of the potential put a negative sign we get the electric field. Once we know the electric field we can compute what is called this psi which is a surface charge density charge per unit area we will determine what it is in terms of the electric field now and we have to square it divide by 2 epsilon and that is a magnitude of the force that acts on this conductor, on this conductor or any other conductor and this force is going to act only on the surface. It is a surface force like water pressure. If you dip a, a body into water, there is going to be pressure that the body will feel only on the surface. So, this is also a surface force. So, it is going to be force per unit area that F e that we have here, it is the force per unit area it is a magnitude which is equal to psi square over 2 epsilon and the direction along the normal to the surface at that point. Sometimes we call this surface force as traction. Now, let us see a little bit about electrostatics. We have to start with Coulomb's law that is all of us know that if there are two charges, if there are two charges q 1 and q 2 as shown here the force between them is given by q 1 q 2 by 4 pi epsilon naught times r square where r is the distance between the two charges. So, here if I have charge 1 and charge 2 between these if there is a charge distance r the force is given by let us say this is q 1 charge q 2 charge q 1 q 2 by 4 pi epsilon naught r square times r 1 2 meaning that between this charge and this charge if they have the same sign then they will repel meaning that the force applied by this charge on this will be in the di direction and this charge by this on the this direction you have the same sign. They are opposite signs this is the same sign for the two 
charges if they have opposite sign it will be an attractive force this is opposite signs you know that alike charges repel and unlike charges attract now here if you say what is electric field due to a point charge this is the formula for it you have a charge q divided by 4 of epsilon r square and then it will be from the point joining this charge location to the point where you want an electric field that is our r12 and the magnitude of that is r the electric field due to the single charge and potential due to that we have to say how much work needs to be done to bring a unit charge from infinity to that point that is a potential and if you use these two concepts you can derive that electric field is negative of the potential that we wrote in the previous slide. Now, there is another concept which is D which is called the electric displacement vector it is simply epsilon multiplied by E epsilon is a permittivity of the medium multiplied by electric field and that is electric displacement. This electric displacement if I take the normal component of that because electric displacement is going to act everywhere in the domain because electric field everywhere when you come to the boundary of the conductor that electric displacement if I take the normal of this D dot product with the uh, if I take normal component of D which is simply the dot product of D and the normal vector what we get is nothing but the surface charge that was there in the formula for force that we just discussed. So, electric force is psi square by 2 epsilon in the direction of the normal ok. In electrostatics we have a fundamental law besides Coulomb's law which is Gauss's law. Gauss's law states that the surface integral of this d vector d dot d s done over the entire surface is equal to the total charge enclosed in that one. If I take some uh, s here ok, let there be lot of conductors, dielectrics or whatever other things that may be there ok. If I do this over the surface s, if I take this d everywhere dot with d s and do this integral over the surface that will be equal to the total charge contained in this that is the integral form of the Gauss's law. Differential form if we use the Gauss divergence theorem where something which has a surface integral convert, convert to volume integral. So, it, this would have been a volume integral times d v and then this is psi v d v. So, we just say that that is equal to that and since d is epsilon times e and E is minus gradient of uh, phi, we get that this quantity is equal to simply del square phi and that is equal to psi v and if there is no charge psi v here is volumetric charge that is charge per unit volume volumetric charge. If that is equal to 0 which is most of the time we will not have charge there what we need to do is we have to solve this equation del square phi is equal to 0. That means that in order to solve for phi in this problem we have to we know the boundary here the entire conductor is at potential v 1 this is at v 2 in between if I want to get phi as a function of x y z I need to solve this equation that is del square phi is equal to 0 that is the equation we need to solve in computing phi once you know phi we can compute E as negative of gradient of phi and then we can take the electric field multiply by epsilon get D and take the normal component of D and that will be our surface charge this normal component of electric field is E n and if you multiply by epsilon that will become D n that is equal to surface charge. Now, if there is a small charge here because charge will be distributed on the conductor surface there would not be any charge inside the conductor. Now, due to this charge there will be a force that will induce at other places. So, electric field is nothing but the force per unit charge if you want to get the force we have to multiply electric field by a differential charge d q E d q we just said that E normal component is psi s by 
epsilon and we there is a 2 that is coming here that comes because there is whenever the electric field is 0 inside electric field is 0 inside the body whereas, it is not 0 outside the body when we take that interface one side to other side this half comes because there is a sudden jump in electric field from a 0 value to either value. So, there will be uh, half the contribution this side half the contribution on that side of course, these arguments have to be carefully done in order to understand where this half comes from. For now, it suffices to say that the E n component normally the books will say there is E 1 n and then E 2 n that is there is a one side this is a side 1 and side 2 where to take the fact that electric field suddenly jumps and that gives you the 2 here in this formula psi s by 2 epsilon times d q and we see that d q is surface transition time small area d a psi s by d a. If you take d a here this becomes force per unit area that is equal to psi s psi s psi s square by 2 epsilon. So, this is the force that we get that is how we compute the force acting on the body which is in the electrostatic field. Now, we already said that for the intervening medium we need to solve this equation which we call Laplace equation Laplace equation and inside the conductors there is usually no charge if there were to be charge or on the conductor if there were to be some charge we have to use this one del square phi equal to some non zero value which we call Poisson equation. Okay. So, that we can compute the potentials and then from the potential the electric field from that the vector d and then surface charge and then the force. There is an alternate way to do this which is uh, to use the integral form of the Gauss's law and find what is called the Green's function solution. Green's function for this one that is this is one of the solutions for the integral form of the Gauss law which we have seen in this slide. This is the integral from the Gauss law. The solution for this there is a Green's function solution which is shown here. You can use this and uh, solve it using BEM which is boundary element method. Boundary element method that can be used to solve this or if you solve the differential equation we can use the finite element method to solve the differential equation either one is fine. We can use finite element method and solve the differential equation or use boundary element method and solve the integral equation. Okay. Now, let us see how there is coupling between electrostatic field and the elastic field. For that let us take a bulky conductor let us call this a bulky conductor intentionally shown to be very stiff and rigid other one is a slender conductor such as the one shown here. Normally in the uh, micro machine structures the substrate will be like a bulky conductor and the one that moves either it is a beam or a plate or uh, uh, a, a membrane whatever that we have there which is free to move or which is very flexible that is slender conductor and there is a bulky conductor. Now, if you apply a potential between these two points. So, we are showing some V between this conductor and that conductor then we can solve either the differential equation or the integral equation to compute phi and then electric field and then D and then surface charge and that surface charge can be shown let us say it is something like this positive here and negative over there. And when there is charge there will be force between the two electrostatic force and that force will cause this slender structure conductor to deform as shown. So, it has deformed from there to here. Now, you see that uh, because of the deformation 
the problem has to be solved again in the electrostatic domain because originally it was over here and it has come from there till here. So, we have to solve this problem again that will check charge distribution and then we have to repeat it. So, we have to first take the problem and do the charge distribution electro ca causing electrostatic force of attraction between the two and apply that force on the conductors deform it and then deformation of the conductor changes the charge distribution. So, you have to go back here and keep on doing this several times until we get a self consistent solution between <coughs> excuse me electrostatics and the elastic deformation. Let us see that in the form of equations here <coughs> we are showing the integral form of the electrostatic equation this is electrostatics. And once we solve it we will get the potential and then we will get the electric field and then we will get the electric displacement we get a surface turgidity psi and that psi goes here we get the electrostatic force this is electro static force and that force goes in here as the traction or surface force on the elastic body then the deformation changes and that has to be fed back here because the surfaces would have changed because of u surface geometry would have changed you have to redo this and do this again and again and again until this equation and this set of equations are satisfied together that is we want a self consistent solution between the two sets of governing equation between elastic and electrostatic fields. All this may sound uh, quite complicated at uh, the first sight indeed it is in fact that is why the modeling software for electrostatic uh, micro systems are quite sophisticated and at the same time they do take considerable amount of computation time if you want to analyze a complicated structure. And it turns out that this coupling leads to some catastrophic phenomena meaning that suddenly something that you do not anticipate happens. So, let us take a very simple one dimensional lumped model to analyze what is going on in this coupled problem. For that let us imagine like a pressure sensor where there is a diaphragm and there is a uh, electrode. Now, if I apply voltage between these two that is I close this switch what happens to this because of the force this is going to deform and we need to analyze by solving all those equations instead let us model this uh, plate or diaphragm as a spring of spring constant k and make this diaphragm or a plate as just a flat plate that does not deform because we have captured the deformation as this lumped spring this is a lumped model lumped model we just have put a spring and this plate and the bottom plate that is this one we are simply giving it as a plate there is a gap g naught between the between them and a is the plate area a is the area of the plate area of the plate and here the force this is the electrostatic force is half epsilon naught a by g naught minus x square where x is the displacement of this plate this is x. Earlier we had seen that between two plates parallel plates the force is how did we compute that force was F e electrostatic force is negative of do half c v square divided by do g ok. g here is whatever g naught that we have minus the displacement that is shown downwards original gap is g naught when this plate plate moves by an amount x the gap is going to be g naught minus x that is how we have gotten this. Now, for equilibrium between the elastic and electrostatic problem we need to have the mechanical force which is 
k times the displacement k x is the force due to a spring that should be equal to electrostatic force. So, if you see there is k x here and there is g naught minus x square in the denominator if I take it uh, to this side I get a cubic equation. A cubic equation can have all three real roots or one real root and two complex conjugate roots. In any case there will be three roots sometimes all real sometimes a real root and two imaginary roots. But a real model such as this one which solution does it take because does it take the first root or the second root or the third root. If I take this beam apply a voltage it is going to deform to one position it is not going to uh, have any ambiguity as to whether it should take this or that or that right. So, in order to analyze that we need to discuss the stability of the equilibrium solutions and to see the stability let us look at the forces the mechanical force which is shown as a straight line here and then this other curved one is the electrostatic force. You can see that when x is equal to g naught it is going to blow up as it is indicated over there. Okay. Now, as we saw the nature of the equation cubic these two have three solutions here is 1, here is 2, here is 3. And the third one is a material because this point corresponds to g naught this is more than that. That means that this plate has to penetrate this ground electrode which is not feasible. So, we do not need to worry about the solution third solution between these two which one would we take then we talk about stability. In order to look at discuss the stability let us plot that potential energy of this system which is given by the spring mechanical force half k x square for this lumped model minus this epsilon naught a over g naught minus x uh, the, the half here and then v square basically half c v square is a negative sign because when you take gradient and put a negative sign you get the electrostatic force whereas for the mechanical force you do not need to put a negative sign. So, we take care of that in writing potential energy with a negative sign here. If I take the derivative of this potential energy I get back this equation let us see that because we have P e if I do dou P e by dou x I will get half k x square when I take derivative just becomes k x and then if I take derivative of this epsilon naught a by 2 remains as it is 1 over g naught x g naught minus x it will become g naught minus x square and then minus x will lead to minus 1 1 over would have given 1 minus minus 1 those two get cancelled. So, this minus n remains the same and then we have the v square as it is that is the uh, equilibrium equation that is just force balance. To discuss stability we need to take a second derivative of the potential energy. So, we need to take the second derivative which is dou square P e by dou x square that will from here it will simply be k and this will be epsilon naught a b square by g naught minus x cube this have 2 in the denominator will go away when you take derivative of 1 over g naught minus x and uh, that is what we get this for stability. If this is positive that corresponds to the minimum of the strain energy if it is negative it corresponds to the maximum. So, between the two we know that uh, the one that is minimum is a solution because potential energy when it is minimized that corresponds to the stable equilibrium the maximum corresponds to unstable equilibrium. So, it is clear that uh, between uh, these two uh, problems that is between the these two solutions which is the first solution second solution the plate will choose this one that is closer this is x equal to 0 the plate is moving and it is prefer this ok. And now we already said that the third solution is more than g naught so we do not worry about it. Now let us say I increase this voltage from v 1 to let us say v 2 which is larger than v 1. So, the so displacement has to be more. So, this uh, stable root will move to the right and it so happens that the unstable root will move to the left. So, when I keep on increasing this voltage to let us say volt v 3 then this minimum and the maximum there coalesce into one point and that is a transition point or a uh, catastrophic point where beyond which there is no real root other than 
one that is more than G naught. These two become complex conjugate and you do not have a solution. So, what will happen then is the plate, the moving plate, this is bottom plate is fixed, it will just move down and touch the bottom plate and it will make a short circuit. Okay. So, in order to analyze that uh, critical condition for uh, stability of this, we have to take the second derivative and equate it to 0 and also we have the uh, original equation which is the equilibrium there is a dou P e by the first equation is dou square P e by dou x square equal to 0. Second equation which is this one is dou P e by dou x equal to 0. When we solve these two simultaneously we will notice that x at this critical point is one third of the gap and then the potential which is called the pull in voltage this is the pull in voltage that turns out to be 8 times g naught cubed divided by 27 epsilon naught a with a square root and this is the pull in voltage. So, as we increase if you go back to this uh, problem if I have this spring and when I apply voltage when it is pull in it will just move x equal to g naught by 3 and there will be gap which is 2 times g naught by 3 it will move there. If it is more than the pull in voltage it will simply come and collapse if it is more than the pull in voltage. Computing this pull in voltage is very important because you do not want our microstructure to be unstable. So, we have to do it in such a way that whatever voltage is applied on it or this structure is going to experience should be below this pull in voltage. Otherwise, there will be a catastrophic phenomenon where the plates come together by themselves. Now, what happens if there were to be a dielectric layer as it is shown here? So, we have a dielectric layer, this part is, is already marked is a dielectric layer, okay, whose thickness is T d. Then, if you were to redo this calculation, meaning that we say dou P e by dou x equal to 0, where our P e is half k x square as before minus half c, c now is epsilon naught a by the gap g naught minus x plus also this T d should be there, but the T d will be epsilon r has to divide this T d times v square epsilon r here this is the relative permittivity of the dielectric relative permittivity of the dielectric layer. If you do that pull in voltage will have a different formula as it is shown here. Now, the reason we consider this is to explain another subtle point here which is first as we increase the voltage as we are doing here the displacement that is displacement of the plate keeps on increasing and suddenly it pulls in right. Now, if this dielectric layer were not to be there it will go and touch the bottom electrode short circuit happens that is the end of the story. But now since there is a dielectric it has to stop there mechanically and there is no short circuit. Now, if we decrease the voltage what would happen would it just jump back from there actually it does not happen it will stay there at that point for a while that is we have to have to reach another voltage called pull up voltage which is over here which is smaller than the pull in voltage comes back and then it will go to 0. So, when I am increasing the curve will go like this increasing the voltage and then the pull in occurs at that point if you decrease the pull in voltage there will be a point where there will be a pull up voltage it will move there and then it will follow back from here. So, it goes from here like this like this jump up and then go from here to there and this is like a hysteresis it is not really hysteresis in terms of uh, the, there being a loss of energy is just that the going forward and backward has a different behavior in this case. And in fact, it has been exploited in some of the commercial devices and one of them is shown here where 
this company says that if you think of the butterfly why it has this iridescent colors that is because on its surface they say there are these small membranes the gap underneath and even whenever that gap closes the optics comes in here where the uh, gap between the top electrode and bottom electrode is lambda by 4 thickness of this is lambda by 4. So, from here to here it is lambda by 4 from here to lambda by 4 the total is lambda by 2 the light falling off of this and going other one that reflects on the bottom one and going they both will be in phase or out of phase of a phase depending on whether the plate has moved in as it is here or not that is when actuated or not actuated you can have constructive and destructive interference and make the images the pixel correspond to this uh, portion to be dark or gray and if you adjust this thickness and gaps according to the wavelength of red green and blue the primary colors you can actually create a static image. So, by addressing each of these mirrors that is shown here just like they say the butterfly gets its uh, wonderful colors <coughs> excuse me we can also create static images this is a commercial product. In fact, this is the same principle or similar principle is used in the electrostatic micro mirror there again in order to tilt the mirror this way or that way we have to apply a voltage that is beyond the pulling voltage of course, there k is like a torsional spring because there, are, there were we had two torsional beams there is a mirror in between that can tilt one way or the other there you have to get torsional spring constant and do the same analysis that we did in order to get the pulling voltage and if you apply voltage that is more than pulling voltage it will just tilt that way and this way we can tilt the beam very fast. Okay. Now, if we start moving away from our 1D model we looked at that 1D model mean one dimensional just a lump spring and parallel plate both in electrostatics and elastic uh, field it is a lump model. Now, if we want to get more accurate result then we have to solve the differential equation there is no other way which we have discussed. Now, let us say that we want to have a domain in between. So, it is not full scale three dimensional analysis of electrostatics and uh, elastic field uh, nor it is as simple as just having a spring and a uh, parallel plate approximation in between let us say we take this as a beam then we have earlier discussed the governing equation for a beam which is given as E i times fourth derivative of the transverse displacement if this we assume that this is a beam it is going to deform. So, that is u of x everywhere four derivative of that with respect to x. So, x is here in this direction that is x 0 here and l here. So, here x equal to 0 here x equal to l. So, E i d to the 4 u by d x to the 4 and this is the electrostatic force. So, here you if you notice instead of a we have put w that is for unit length length is this direction we have put epsilon naught w v square by 2 into g naught minus u earlier we had x note that this u is a function of x. So, we have to solve this equation if we also want to put the residual stress then we need to include that as well concept of residual stress the concept of residual stress we had discussed in one of the earlier lectures we have to put this this equation you need to solve clearly this equation cannot be solved analytically. So, you have to have you have to get a numerical solution of this equation numerical solution. Okay. And if you want to solve the general 3D problem if you want to know how the commercial microsystem modeling uh, software programs solve this one we have to look at the equation that we had earlier where we we said integral form can be used solved using boundary element method something like this and if you were to in the boundary element method in finite element method we would discretize the entire domain into small elements here also we divide into small elements but only on the surfaces that is advantage of the boundary element method we only work work with boundaries. So, there the elements we can call them panels. 
small triangles. If I have some domain like this, I would uh, divide this whole thing into small triangles like this, some panels. Okay, something like this. We can divide this into small triangles. Okay, each panel is a boundary element. Then we can make this integration become summation over this because psi is q divided by area of the panel q q i by a i, and then this Green's function can be written in this form. That is equal to potential on that surface which we know potentials are known we need to compute the uh, charges on each panel you, you need to solve this equation if you work this out and assemble in the form of uh, a matrix that is going to look like this the p the potential vector is equal to the p matrix times the charges which we do not know so if you want to solve it you have to get this or c times p if i rearrange it p inverse goes that side this is nothing but the capacitance because we know that for a parallel plate capacitor q equal to c v. So, this is the higher dimensional version of q equal to c v. q is a charge, v is of course, the voltage, this is the capacitance, this is the capacitance in the higher dimension. So, we can once p's are known, we can compute q using C p equal to q relationship. Now, if you come to the elastic domain, this force this is psi square by 2 epsilon in the normal direction to the surface there. And if you put this into our loading of the problem for mechanical just as we had C p equal to q the linear linear modeling this elastic one linear modeling k u equal to f k we call this as stiffness matrix and use the displacement that is equal to the applied loads. We can compute it, but then because of u this thing will change again because capacitance depends on the geometry. We need to solve it again go here, go here, go here. So, by going back and forth between these three we can solve this problem eventually, but if you want to do it little bit more efficiently that is this kind of relaxation that is we have to solve the electrostatic problem, solve the mechanical problem go back and forth is called the relaxation approach. That is finally, as we iterate between elastic and electrostatic domains after a while it would converge, but it may take a very long time to converge and especially in the vicinity of the pull in voltage when the voltage that you applied is very close to pull in voltage of that particular system then it would take a long time to converge. So, you can you need to find better approaches for doing it which is done by taking derivatives which is one what is called a surface Newton where you compute the gradients only on the surfaces of the boundaries uh, surfaces of the conductors. And uh, there is another one where you can go the Newton method where you take the sensitivities not only the surface nodes, but also the interior nodes. So, you can have the coupling terms between the mechanical and uh, electrostatic fields as it is shown here and we need to perturb the displacements and the charges on the two and try to finally, make these two residuals 0. So, we can use this also which is what is being done in the commercial microsystems modeling software now. So, if we have a comb drive a structure accelerometer, gyroscope, comb drive, pressure sensor, RF switch any of these devices if you take if they are using electrostatic force or they are using capacitive sensing technique we need to use the modeling that we have just discussed. So, if you take the comb drive okay, this is just one uh, view of the comb drive where whatever is hatched here is anchored it is fixed rest of the portion which is in this color is going to deflect and this portion is what we call folded beam suspension folded beam suspension again there is anchor here there is anchor here. Okay. Now, if there is uh, a voltage potential applied between this moving structure and the ground it experiences electrostatic force at every pair of these comb fingers 
here, here, everywhere. For that, we know how much force will be exerted when things move inside like this. For that, we need to first estimate, let us say, before we go to three dimensional modeling, we want to just estimate the pulling voltage. For that, we take we treat uh, this volume suspension as four beams on this side, which are fixed and guided, fixed and guided, a, a lump modeling technique that we had discussed in one of the earlier chapters and look at whether the series are parallel, finally reduce this whole suspension into just one spring of spring constant k and then we will have a plate for the electrostatic one, a parallel plate capacitor. So, just as k is a lumped constant of the mechanical behavior of the structure, parallel plate capacitor is the lumped model for the electrostatic behavior. So, if we compute that k and uh, try to see what the pulling voltage is, we get a value and then if you go to finite element software and plot it, here what we are plotting is potential here. So, we have electrostatic uh, comb drive which has a suspension which is this portion and then there are combs over here. When, I, when we apply uh, potential between these two, there will be a potential that exists in the entire domain and there also electric field and then a force and so forth. Okay. If you want to compute the pulling voltage for the three dimensional structure such as this, you have to start with some initial V value voltage you have to start some, some value and then raise it to another value, raise it another value and then see how displacement looks like. If the pulling is going to occur, so what we would find is that displacement initially will increase like that and suddenly at some point it just goes to infinity. So, this is displacement versus voltage potential. Okay. Where does it occur? We had derived the lumped model. So, if I take this spring constant here, I know the thickness, width of the beams, length of the beams if I know this k, then using the formula for pull-in voltage, we can compute the pull-in voltage as well as pull-up voltage there to be a dielectric and then we can go back and do detailed finite element simulation such as this one and get the result. What is shown here the potential or equipotential line, if I take this LO if it is the same line that is the equipotential line okay. and the electric field always will be normal to this. And between the two comb fingers, if you really zoom in over here, we can see that field lines here is go are going to be parallel. That is perpendicular to the conductors, but field lines themselves will be parallel to each other. And around the corners, we will have some crowding of the field line, which is called the fringe field effect. And there are ways to account for this fringing field effects in the lumped model by putting a correction factor, but in general if you have access to a finite element or bound element solver, you can solve the problem numerically as it is shown here in a commercial software uh, called FemLab, its name now is uh, Comsol. There are lot of others ANSYS uh, and also there are uh, customized modeling software for microsystems called Coventroware, IntelliSuite and uh, Softmems and many others and you can use them to solve the coupled equation. What we have done in this lecture now is to discuss how we can start with uh, Coulomb's equations, Coulomb's law and go all the way to electrostatic force look at the coupled problem. So, that in a comb dry problem such as this if I apply voltage between these two, we can see if you focus on this portion where it was and where it has moved. That is these comb fingers which were at some point like this after while this moves up here, this finger would have moved up relative to that and that is what we see by solving this. This is an iterative process, we have to solve the electrostatic problem, do the elect, elect, elastic problem and again do this and do that. There is a very strong coupling between the electrostatic field and the elastic field because electrostatic field is dependent on the geometry of the conductors, but then due to the force electrostatic force, the
the geometry of the conductors changes that is they deform and they disturb the field. So, you have to recompute that and then the force changes you have to recompute the deformations and then that would have changed the electrostatic field and we have to keep on iterating between the two fields and that is why we have a very strong coupling. And in fact, there is uh, this pull in phenomena that we discussed earlier where you can think of this, this is a potential energy curve we had seen that the, there is a minimum and the maximum, but if you think of what happens in reality if there is a ball here and that energy is equal to this maximum energy it will roll down here go there and if it is voltage slightly more than that it will just plummet over that is there is something called a dynamic pull in voltage the formula for that also can be derived just as we had derived the static pull in voltage formula here remember that the energy at the beginning is equal to energy at the maximum okay something that we can do and we look at the dynamics of this uh, model which we will discuss in the next lecture. Now, we have discussed statics and the pull in occurs, but now in the next lecture we will discuss the dynamics where we will consider what happens if the voltage that applied itself is time varying V t. Just to summarize what we have discussed today, coupling between elastic and electrostatic fields is very strong and it leads to this strange phenomena called pull in and then pull up hysteresis like behavior which is exploited in certain devices and we discuss the methods to solve this problem both with 1D model to un understand why this happens and how to solve it. And in the general beam equation or the 3D models what equation need to be solved in order to compute this pull in voltage or pull up voltage. And we find that lump modeling is a very useful tool to get insight into the problem and also in design. So, next lecture we discuss the dynamic effects of uh, coupling between elastic and electrostatic problems. If you have any questions you can uh, send me an email at suresh at mechinch.iisc.ernet.in. Thank you.